This is the penultimate talk of our Hope series. Uh, we end our Hope series on Resurrection Sunday, which uh, what a perfect way to end uh, looking at biblical hope and hope in God. And today, of course, is Palm Sunday, um, as I referenced earlier. And I just want to remind you that on uh, this Friday at midday, there is a one-hour service here um, of, of quiet meditation and scripture. And um, at four o'clock at our Hatfield site, which is going to be meeting at Eden House in Hatfield, um, they have a four o'clock service of Holy Communion. And so if, if you'd like to mark Good Friday, um, then you have two options there for you to do so. Well, we're going to, um, as I said, penultimate talk in the Hope series. And we've been looking over the number of weeks around what is biblical hope. And um, if you've missed any of our talks, you can, of course, catch up on our YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe and that bell notification to get important updates through the week. And if you're watching online, hit that like button and uh, subscribe. Um, but if you have missed, do catch up. We've had some amazing speakers who have looked at what we can put our hope in God. And when we look at biblical hope, what we've understood it to be is a confident expectation in the fulfillment of the promises of God to us. It, hope isn't, a biblical hope isn't wishful thinking. It isn't, I hope that it doesn't rain. I hope that this works out. Biblical hope has a firm foundation on the living God. And so when we're talking about hope, we're talking about a confident expectation that his promises towards us will come to pass. And Romans 12, 12 has really been the anchor verse for this series that says this, rejoice in hope. Hope is supposed to have an outwork and there is a fruit of biblical hope. And one of the talks we looked at that. But one of that is a, the ability to rejoice in all circumstances, knowing that we can have a firm foundation and hope in God. And that is an outworking of biblical hope. I would say an out, outworking of worldly hope is anxiety. I hope this works. An outworking of biblical hope is rejoicing that we can trust in Him. And what I want to do this morning is look at a subject that we are all intimately uh, across and aware of, and it is the question of waiting. Intrinsically linked with hope is the requirement and truth of waiting, isn't it? Think about it. If one did not have to wait, then hope would not be required, right? Waiting comes with hope. If you don't have to wait for something, you don't have to hope for it because it's arrived. And so waiting is a massive component of the subject of hope, and that's what I want to look at this morning. But the truth is, we don't like to wait, do we? Okay, the truth is, I don't like to wait. All of you guys are perfect with patience, no doubt. More than that, though, it's not just that we don't like it. Waiting is hard, isn't it? It goes against the grain, doesn't it, of our fleshly desires, uh, in fact, it's more than it, the fact that it goes against the grain. It's more than just we have an internal pressure. Uh, increasingly, we have everything going against us in this culture, don't we? And the world we live in. In previous generations, I would say waiting probably came a little bit easier. They saved for what they needed. Uh, they built over the long term. Letters. Do you remember those things? They took time to be delivered. And travel could take days, weeks, or even months. But now we live in an instant world, don't we? Quite unique, I would suggest, to this generation over thousands of years. Since the introduction of credit in the early 70s, mid-60s, the need to save was slowly, slowly removed. Even now online, I've seen it on the checkout, you can hit a button and instantly spread it over three payments with 0%. I mean, that's helpful, don't get me wrong. But, it, but slowly, slowly what happens is it enforces that desire in us for something to be instant, even if we are not able to pay for it. Communication is instant, isn't it? Think about it. We don't need letters anymore. 
I mean, I remember at school having to have a lesson on how to write an envelope. Do you remember that? I don't think they do that anymore. Oh, they do. For us, and they do. Oh, thank you. Well, they do. I'm glad. When they use that skill, who knows? <laughs> um, but with each new innovation and new app comes the promise of convenience and instantness. Is that a word? Instancy. Is that a word? It is now. Instancy. I love that word. And you know what it's like? It's like boiling a frog in water. You know, if you put a frog in boiling water, it's going to leap out. But if you put a frog in cold water and boil it slowly, it won't even realize. I think that's like us. I don't think we realize that we live in an instant world until something in our life comes across and bumps us into a waiting scenario. And that's exactly what happened to me on Friday. Oh, man. Let me tell you what happened to me on Friday. I went to use my computer in my garden office. And it's run out of space. So I think, okay, I better delete some things. I delete some things. That didn't fix it. I thought, I'm going to have to reset this machine and reinstall it. <laughs> oh, boy. That was in the morning. It took hours. I had to restore it from the cloud and blah, blah, blah. And all I saw was, please wait, and this circle thing. And just stood there watching, not stood, sat there watching the percentages. It was painful. I'm, like, I'm not used to this. It should be instant, shouldn't it? And while I was waiting, do you know what I did? I'm embarrassed to admit this. I went onto YouTube on my phone, and I was scrolling, and I got these things called YouTube Shorts. Aren't they good? But I discovered I haven't got the patience to wait for the end of one of these shorts. I mean, three seconds in, I'm like, I'm bored of this. Where's the next one? I reckon they're going to have shorter shorts coming out soon. Three second punchy shorts. You heard it here first. But it was a rude awakening that I am not used to waiting. It took hours to get this computer sorted, and in that moment, I struggled. And so we have a problem with waiting, but we have another problem with waiting is that as Christians, we're required to wait. We need to remember something God's plan for us is perfect. Do I get an amen in the house for that? Okay, you also need to remember this. His timing for us is perfect. Less of an amen for that one. If we believe that God has a perfect plan for us, we need to realize and understand that his timing is perfect for us too. And unfortunately, God's timing isn't the same as our timing. His timing requires us to wait. And so with that, I'd like us to look at our scripture this morning, which is Psalm 130. And there are many Psalms, especially those written by um, David, where he talks about the need to wait. And in fact, you can read it in the prophets. I think a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Jeremiah, and he was talking about waiting. But I would like to read Psalm 130. Starting at verse 1, it will be on the screen in the room or indeed on your device. Let's turn together. It says this, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my plea for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark my iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. Do you see the link between waiting and hope? My soul, he says, waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning. And just so that we get the point, he says it again. This is not a mistake on the screen. More than watchmen in the morning. More than those watchmen who are there on the walls watching during the night shift and waiting for the... More than that, my soul waits for you, O Lord. And then he says this, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. What a great psalm. 
What does it say in verse five? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I hope. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, it's interesting here that David is saying, my soul. What does that mean? It means every part of David, every part of him, his mind, his body, his will, his emotions, his whole posture to the Lord is a posture of waiting on the Lord. You know, sometimes we can in our minds say, well, I'm gonna wait for God intellectually. That makes sense. We've had enough Bible teaching to know that's what we should do. But inside our heart isn't waiting at all. Inside our heart is anxious Inside our heart is trying to find a solution for ourselves. But here the psalmist is saying to us, listen, your whole soul, your whole being should be waiting for the Lord. But what kind of waiting is this? Listen, this is not some kind of passive, inactive waiting. This is not just lying down saying when it happens, it happens. It is an active type of waiting that we read about. And he says it here, it's about standing on the truth of God's word in the waiting. You see, waiting in God has a foundation on the truth of who he is and what he said to us. You see that? Let's look together at Psalm 27, another psalm that David wrote. One to three. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Again, he's talking about his whole being. Oh my God, in you I trust. You see, whatever you put your trust in is that which you put your hope in. We looked at that many a time. If you put your trust in your finances, you'll put your hope in your money to get you out of situations and to give you a secure future. If you trust in your own skill set and your abilities, other than recognizing they're given from God, then you will hope that you can get yourself out of a situation or put yourself in one. What happens is is the thing that you trust in becomes the thing that you hope. But what David is saying here is, I'm gonna declare that it's God in whom I trust. And that is a question for each one of us. Can we say with David, I trust in you, O God? And then he says this, let me not put to shame. Isn't that a reality? You say to your friends, I'm hoping on God for this. And they're like, ooh, let's see how that goes for you. Maybe one of you, maybe you're in that position right now. Maybe you feel tempted to, maybe someone's saying, you just gotta go out on the dating field and date as many people as you can. And you just gotta get yourself out there. Have you heard that phrase? Get yourself out there, you know? It's fine. You're like, no, I really feel the Lord is saying that he's gonna give me that partner and I am to wait. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that dating per se is wrong. Hear my heart here. I'm talking about the attitude of heart. And you'll say, no, I believe that God has a partner for me. And they're like, well, you're silly, aren't you? Look at your age, you're getting on a bit, you know? And maybe some of you are in that place. I wanna say God will not put you to shame. In your faithfulness, in your declaration that you will put your trust in God. And the psalmist goes on to say, let not my enemies exalt over me. Don't let them say, nah, nah, I told you so. That's really what that means. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. They will be eventually. And then David says this, make me to know your ways, O Lord. You know, knowing God's ways helps us do the waiting. When we understand his ways, and we're gonna look at this in a moment, it helps us with the waiting. And this is David, by the way. I mean, David had to wait a long time to be king. If you know the story, Samuel the prophet goes to Jesse and says, hey, God told me I need to anoint one of your sons as king. And he lines up all his great sons and big, strong, mighty, whatever. And he gets in and says, no, this isn't it. Have you got another son? Well, there's David, you know, little David. He's out in the fields. Well, go and get David. David comes, that's the one. And Samuel anoints him as king. He's 16 years old, can you imagine? Now, if I was David, I'd be like, great, when's the coronation? Next week, I'm free Monday. Guess how long it took David to become king? 
14 years. That's a long time waiting. And you see, when David wrote these Psalms, Psalm 27 that we just wrote, David, uh, scholars will say David was um, at the time running from persecution from Saul during that 14 year period. And yet he is saying, I will wait on the Lord. Wow, I wanna be like that. What faithfulness. Why? Because he knew the ways of God. And that's what I wanna look at this morning. I would like us to look at the purposes of God in our waiting. And I have, how many? Four to give us this morning. What is the point of waiting? And I want to say this before we look at the four. We need to remember that God is purposeful in our waiting. Listen to this. God is purposeful in the waiting. It's not that God has dozed off or nodded off. You're like, God, I'm still here. It's been six years and I'm not king yet. I know you need a nap. No, that's not it. And God doesn't need a nap. It's not that all of a sudden he's changed his mind and doesn't like you anymore. We need to understand, ultimately, when, when David says, you know, let me know your ways, we need to know that his way is motivated by love for us. Fundamentally, we need to start at that root. Before we can look at those four things, we need to understand that God is purposeful in our waiting and it is out of love for us. You understand? Are you, are you with me on that? When we're waiting, it's not wasted time. Waiting and wasted time are different things. I can waste my time being busy. But you see, in the waiting, in having hope, for the promises of God, God is working in us and through us. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher and pastor said this about waiting. If the Lord Jehovah makes us wait, let us do so with our whole hearts. For blessed are all they that wait for him. He is worth waiting for. The waiting itself is beneficial to us. It tries faith exercises patience, trains submission, and endears the blessing when it comes. The Lord's people have always been awaiting people. Amen, brother. Okay, let's look at some of those as we unpack that together. Then the first one is this. What is the purpose in God's waiting? He prepares us for the blessing to come. To be frank, some of you aren't ready for the blessing that God's promised you. You might think you're ready, but you're not ready. God knows the right time to fulfill that promise in your life, whatever that may be, whatever you're putting your hope in. Maybe you are at the 13-year mark and you're saying, I could have done with this 13 years ago. No, you couldn't. God knows. Maybe if you had it too early on, that gift that God would have given you or that platform would have caused pride in you. Maybe that thing that he's going to promise to give you, if he gives it too soon, becomes an idol for you. Maybe we would use the authority that God is promising you in terms of a position in a way in which would be damaging to other people. Listen, you wanna talk about waiting, friends. I was 16 when I felt as if God said that I'm gonna be in the ministry full time. I only started in the ministry full time six years ago. And I'm 46, so you do the math, because I'm not that good. 24 years, right? Sorry? 30, see, no one could do maths here. 16 plus something equals 40. It is 24, thank you. Lord, I pray just for love for my brothers and sisters in this room. Thank you that you called me to be a pastor for this wonderful flock. But I had to wait. If God had said, right, yeah, okay, you're gonna be, no. God knows exactly the right time. Listen, I think we, if we actually think about it, we know that's true, right? 
My little boy Daniel, he always comes up with new things he wants to do. I think last week he said he wanted to be an airline pilot, a pilot. And I said, darling, that's a good idea. You can be a pilot. Now, he knew I didn't mean on Monday. I didn't mean next year either. But this is what happens. We hear from God, you're going to be this, and we go, great, okay, I'm ready to go. But God is a good father, and he knows the right time for you. He knows the right time. And you see, we have to, in that place, remember, go to that foundational truth that God is purposeful in the waiting and that he's doing this because he loves you. You have to get in that place. What else? That's the first one, prepares us for the blessing. Number two, reveals our hearts and our motives. Tony Evans, um, a preacher in the US, said this, but sometimes God delays his blessings to examine what's in your heart. He waits on purpose, are you getting the theme here? Purposeful waiting. It's not that he doesn't want to bless you, but he's after a purpose greater than your immediate blessing. God doesn't want to just fix your problems, he wants to transform you in the process. I think we know, again, as we reflect on this, that sometimes in our life, the things that we prayed for, we're so jolly thankful that God didn't answer. Is there an amen in the house? I mean, if if God had answered some of those prayers, I wouldn't be with my beautiful wife, Steph. I'd be with other people, and that would have been a mistake. Some of you are like, you're praying for the wrong person, probably, and God's just like, But sometimes we are asking, Lord, I, want, I really feel you've got this position for me. But what is the motivation of your prayer and your desire? Is it, and God doesn't want to fulfill fleshly desires in you. He wants to give the desires of your heart that he places in there. But God isn't gonna say, oh, you want that? That's a great idea. It's gonna be bad for you and it's motivated by sin, but I'll give you that in a way. God doesn't do that, does he? And in the waiting, as he works in us by his spirit, he opens our eyes, say, you know what, actually, Lord, I don't think I'll need, I don't think I want that. I've reflected, Lord, that the motivation behind that wasn't really a desire from you, but there was something else in me. And if you're in a place of waiting for something, maybe your prayer could be this, Lord, is that really, is that really the desire that you have for me? You see, what happens with this is what happens, and, and uh, as, I, as I pray with people, I see this pattern. We have a picture in our mind of what we believe God wants for us. And then all of a sudden, what happens is, is that slowly, 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 the picture does this. This is God, and this is the picture, it does this. And we seek the picture more than the God who gave it. And what happens when that, when that occurs is that the thing you're waiting for becomes an idol in your life. And God says, I'm just going to take a step back and wait until, until you see what's happening here. And the problem is, whatever is an idol in your life will put you in bondage to it. We, under, we need to understand, let's just take a step back. Why were we created? To have fellowship with God. We are created to worship God. We are beings that love to worship. And if we don't worship God, then we will seek to worship something else, to have something other than God in our hearts that, that becomes an idol, okay? But you see, when we worship God, there is freedom. But when you worship anything other than God, there is bondage. And you wonder why you're getting so frustrated. Why isn't this coming to pass, Lord? You told me this would happen. And you start complaining. And what you see is hurt and pain that this picture hasn't come to pass. And what you're seeing there really is a fruit of being in bondage to that picture. And that is a moment where hope, I pray, that God opens our eyes to say, you know what? You've got that as an idol right now. 
And I want to say this, it's not in my notes. Some of you need to lay those things down and surrender it. You've been holding on to it so tightly that it's become an idol in your life and God is saying, you need to surrender that before I can do anything with you. Whatever that might be for you, let's just pause for a moment. Holy Spirit, would you just open all of our eyes to something that is at the right time and given in the right way, godly and a blessing for us, but Lord, we have turned it into an idol and we seek that fulfillment more than we seek you and your presence. But whatever that is in for us, would you reveal that now? And if God's revealed something to you, then just say, Lord, I've, would you forgive me? I repent of that. And I make a choice right now, Lord, to lay it down and give it to you. And Lord, I pray that rather than seeking the fulfillment of this more than you, that I would seek you more than anything else in my life. Amen. Okay, so sometimes the waiting reveals our hearts and our motives. What about number three? Tests our faith and grows our fruit. There's nothing like waiting to test our faith. Let's look at James 1, 3 to 4. It says this, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, God is focused on conforming you to the likeness of his son. You have been predestined to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus. That's Romans 8, 29. He is more concerned, by the way, about conforming you to the likeness of his son than he is about your comfort. Sorry to break that one at you. He's working on you on the inside out. That's what he's working on. And what he does is he puts us in a position where we have to wait on the fulfillment of his promises to test our faith. Say, well, actually, you know what? I don't think God's gonna do this after all. We've been, I'm, I've been there. I'm sure you've been there. Well, it's just not gonna happen, is it? I just don't believe, Lord. That... And then what do we find? We find that we have something called wavering faith. One day we're like, yes, I believe that God's got this for me. Next day, it's, nah. And it's, you know, we often in that time say, oh, I wish I had so-and-so's faith. They said that, I wish, wish I had their faith. They're such, so faithful. No, God doesn't want you to have the faith of someone else. He's given you a gift of faith. He just wants you to be steadfast in it. And so what he does, he gives us this time of purposeful waiting where he tests our faith. And within that, what happens is as our faith grows and as we continue to seek him in that, he works on the inside out. We know Galatians 5, don't we? The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How does he teach you these things? Oftentimes in the waiting. He can't actually teach you patience in an instant world. And so he places you in a garden called waiting to bear the fruit. And the thing about fruit is it takes time to grow, right? It's not like when you manufacture something in a factory, you can, there it is. Jesus didn't say, you're going to, I'm going to manufacture good works from you. He says, you're going to bear fruit. And bearing fruit, what does it require? It requires us to be connected to the vine, to seek him first. It requires the sun, requires his presence. It requires the rain of the Holy Spirit for water. It requires us to be in a soil full of nutrients called the church. How does he bear fruit in us? In purposeful waiting. And just as we see the seasons, and this week we said, hey, spring has arrived. God puts us in seasons, and some of us and some of you have been in a season of purposeful waiting. Why? Because it's not right. It's not the time yet. You're not in a place where you can bear that fruit quite yet. But in that purposeful waiting, the fruit is growing. Are you with me? Well, that brings us to number four. This is a good one. It gives us something better. 
Amen. Some of you, how, you know, who's experienced that? Yeah, in the waiting, God showed you something even better. Amazing, I don't have to preach this one then. I think a Lazarus is a great example of this, isn't it? The story, you can read it in John 11. Uh, Mary and Martha's brother, Mary and Martha in Bethany, and, and Lazarus is sick, and they send word for Jesus. And Jesus is delayed. What's interesting in this story is in verse four, he said, when Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. What did he say? No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Mary and Martha's plan was, God, come and heal him right now. God's plan was, I'm gonna do something even better than that. I'm gonna raise him from the dead. I just feel the Lord saying this to you. Some of you are looking at a situation in your life and you're saying, Lord, would you fix this? And God is saying, I'm not gonna fix it. I'm gonna revive it in a way it's never been revived before. You're looking at something in decay and say, well, it's fine. If you just fix that bit and that bit, I'll make do with that. God's saying, no, I've got something better for you. I'm gonna give you something new. You see, why does God do that? Because he loves us and he wants to bless us and because he wants to reveal his glory through us. I mean, Lazarus, <laughs> who knows what that situation was like for him. He wakes up, wow. But the glory of God through what God had done through Lazarus, wow. I, I feel intoxicated by that in some healthy way, if one can be healthily intoxicated. It's like, Lord, use me for your glory. I'm not suggesting, Lord, that you raise me from the dead. That's not what I'm saying. But do something through me so powerful, so wonderful, that people say, wow, wow. And I think sometimes God is seeking to show us how big he is, bigger than we ever think or imagine or hope or dream. And so in the waiting, God is waiting to do something even bigger for us. And so there's four. Where do you fit in that? You don't have to answer out loud. Is it because God's preparing you for your ble his blessing? Is it that he's revealing your heart and your motive? Is it that God is testing your faith? Is it that God is wanting to do something better? Or brother and sister, is it that he's doing all four? <laughs> now, you thought I was done, I'm not done yet. I wanna make this super practical. How can we wait in hope? How can we wait and hope then? Let, you know, I hear you, Mark, make sense. And Lord, forgive me if I thought you haven't been purposeful in the waiting and forgive me, Lord, if I've complained and grumbled and said you don't care for me. Like, but how do I wait? Okay. You see, the temptation we have in the waiting is, is this. We either give up on the promises of God. Well, that's not from God anyway. We question the good, goodness of God in the waiting we try and bring it to pass on our own strength. Who remembers the story of Abraham and Sarah? You know, God had promised they'd have a child and they're like, well, this ain't happening, is it? And Sarah's like, well, take my maidservant Haggai and go have a child with her and then maybe there'll be a family that comes out of that. And so Abraham goes, well, okay, I can't be bothered to wait anymore. I'm paraphrasing. And so he goes and thinks, well, that's probably a good plan. And he has Ishmael and the conflict that arises from that and then years later, eventually, they have Isaac. And then in Genesis 17, God says, through Isaac will be my covenant. You see, Abraham decided to do it on his own strength. And that's the temptation that we have. We go, well, you know what, God? You've told me to wait like this. It's not working this way. And so I'm going to do it myself. You know, uh, there's a pastor in, uh, called Adrian Rogers who says this, you can save a lot of time waiting on God. Isn't that good? You can save a lot of time waiting on God. You wanna go and do a detour? Okay. And some of us have to say, Lord, forgive me. I'm tempted to do this myself, but you've been really clear to wait. And sometimes the temptation is just to say, well, God doesn't mind. He said I should wait for a partner, but you know what, I'm not gonna wait. I'm gonna do this, that, and so. Or whatever it might be for you. 
But here's six ways in, in which we can wait. Are you ready? I'm going to just give them very quickly. Number one, with confident expectation. We need to posture ourselves in an active way to say, Lord, I, Lord, I, I make a decision that, you, that I expect good things from you and that you've got a plan for me. Number two, with trust. And this is linked. Now, it says here in Isaiah 64, 4, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. God will act for you. And as we read earlier in 130, Psalm 130, um, what, did, what did David say? I wait for the Lord and in his word I hope. We need to get into his book and wait on him. You can't wait on God devoid of his word. You can't wait on God devoid of his truth. Because what you will do <clears throat> is create a vacuum for lies to come in and tell you something contrary. The battlefield is in the mind. And so we need to wait on his word. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the what? The word. And so we need to get into his word. Number three, with courage. We need to be courageous in the face of patience and suffering that may come with that. And say, you know, I'm gonna be courageous and be strong and I'm gonna stand on it. Even though I don't feel like it, I'm gonna be courageous. By your spirit, would you help me, O Lord? Number four, with quietness. What does this mean? It means to stop grumbling and complaining at God. You can fill in the blanks for yourself. With quietness of spirit. With peace in him. Um, number five, with thankfulness. With thankfulness. Thank you, Lord. You know, I try and start every day when I open my eyes to start with prayers of thankfulness. Thankfulness that you love me. Thank you that you got a plan for me. Thank you that your promises will come to pass. Thank you for the good things in my life. Thank you for that you've blessed me with air to breathe today, with, with, with all the things that I need. Thank you for a roof over my head. And number six, with patience. With patience. With that, can I ask you all to stand? I'm gonna pray.